Hi, my name is Manos Brilakis from VA North Texas Healthcare System and the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. In this presentation, we'll discuss about how to treat a main vessel coronary perforation using a step-by-step -step approach. There are three types of coronary perforation. One of them is the main vessel perforation discussed in this webcast. The second one is perforation of a distal vessel that will be addressed in a different webcast because techniques actually are different for this kind of perforations. And the last one, which is specific to CTOPCI, is perforation of an epicardial collateral that requires treatment from both sides. This is an example of a patient who presented with diffuse LAD disease with significant calcification with two lesions distally and proximal. This is baseline hemodynamics showing a systolic blood pressure of 120 and unremarkable EKG. Due to calcification, he was treated with rotational atherectomy. And then he underwent standing of the proximal lesion with a drug eluting stand, followed by standing of the distal lesion with a long drug eluting stand as well. After standing, the outcome didn't look that bad in geographically. However, we performed intravascular ultrasound. And what was obvious under IVUS is that the patient had some areas of underexpansion within the distally deployed stand. And as a result, we decided to perform some further stent optimization, essentially by doing some more high-pressure balloon inflations. That proved to be not a good choice. We inflated a 2.5 by 20 millimeter balloon, non-compliant balloon, up to 18 atmospheres, and then the balloon ruptured. We did have a lot of difficulty trying to remove the balloon. And when it eventually came out, this is what we saw in the very first picture. Clearly, there is a large perforation at the area of the distal LED stand. So what should we do here? What should be the next step? The next step will be shown in the next slide, but the, also to remember that balloon rupture is something that can cause perforation. So when that happens, you want to perform a contrast injection as soon as possible to identify such a rupture quickly so you can treat it very promptly as well. So the very first thing to do when you have a large vessel perforation, or for any perforation for that matter, is to keep the wire position. Sometimes people get a little stressed out and in the fury of the moment, the wire position can be lost, which is the worst thing that can happen under those circumstances. So what you want is to keep the wire position and then inflate a balloon over that original wire to occlude the vessel. This does two things. One is it buys you time because there is no more extravasation of contrast in the pericardium, so it decreases the likelihood of tamponade. And the second thing it does is just by prolonged balloon inflation, in some cases, that may be all you need to stop the bleeding at the perforation side. This is diagrammatically what we do. So the perforation is here. The very first step is get a balloon at the side of perforation or proximal and inflate it to stop the leakage. And that's exactly what we did in this case. And you can now see that the balloon is inflated. There's more, no more bleeding into the pericardium. However, of course, the patient is going to get ischemic. And that is why whenever we do that, we want to continue other treatment strategies. The patient's blood pressure seems to be getting a little low. However, six minutes later, we have significant hypotension, which, of course, strongly suspects under the scenario that we have tamponade. So if this is the case, what you want to do is do a stat pericardiocentesis. It is great if you have an echo around, but if you don't, you just performed pericardiocentesis under X-ray guidance. And this is exactly what we did in this particular case. This is the pigtail inserted in the pericardium. 600 mLs of blood were drained. And after doing that, blood pressure significantly increased, and the patient is now hemodynamically stable. Sometimes, just inflating the balloon for a prolonged period of time may lead to hemostasis. But unfortunately, that was not the case here. How long is long depends. Sometimes five, sometimes 10 minutes, um, whatever it takes. But once the balloon is inflated for a long period of time and the perforation doesn't seem to be sealed, as is the case in this particular case, then you want to treat the cause, which in a particular case is rupture of the vessel. So for a large vessel perforation, as in our case, what you want to do is deliver a cover stand, and you want to do this using a second guide catheter and a contralateral axis 
The reason for this being you don't want to deflate your balloon and have continued pericardial bleeding while you're delivering the covered step. So second guide is, insert, is inserted, then a second wire is advanced through the area of perforation, and then a covered stand is inserted over the second wire, and then the first wire is withdrawn, and the covered stand is deployed into the area of perforation, hopefully successfully sealing the perforation. So this is the second catheter that is coming from the left groin. We see there is still some extravasation, although less than before, there is still some extravasation happening through the area of rupture. So the second guide comes in, and then we disengage the first guide, and we advance the wire over the second guide catheter. And again, the reason for doing that is to minimize the duration of bleeding into the pericardium. There is only one cover stand in the United States, the Graphmaster RX which requires a 6 French guide for the smaller sizes up to 4.0 and a 7 French for 4.5 and 4.8. You can deliver a 2.8 millimeter graft master through a guide liner, as I will show you in a second. And this is the example here where we do have the graft master 2.8 by 19 inserted through guide liner, which really helps you get through um, the first stand. And uh, graft masters are great stands, but very bulky, very hard to deliver. So having the guide liner close by can really, really facilitate delivery of the stand. It's always good to try this before inserting into the body by trying to get the stand through the guide liner. But again, we have seen in this and other cases that 2.8 French guide is big enough to allow insertion of a covered stand. And by doing that in this particular case, and after good post dilation, because those stands do require high pressures to fully expand, we did have a successful sealing of the perforation with no more extravasation. Importantly, we did not reverse the anticoagulation. And the reason for that is we do have coronary gear into the coronary artery. We do have balloons who have wires. And what can happen if anticoagulation is reversed early on while this equipment is there, then massive clotting can occur causing sometimes worse consequences than the perforation itself. So the general rule is to delay reversing the coagulation until after all equipment is removed from the coronary, and that's exactly what was done in this particular case. So in summary, balloon rupture can cause vessel perforation. When main vessel perforation occurs, the very, very first step is to inflate a balloon to minimize the bleeding into the pericardium. And the next step is to perform pericardiosynthesis if there's tamponade, followed by delivery of a covered stand if the extravasation does not stop after prolonged balloon inflation. The best way to do this is the ping pong guide technique, in which a second guide is advanced next to the first one, the first one is withdrawn, a second wire is advanced through the lesion, and the covered stand is delivered through the second guide catheter, minimizing the time that is needed to have the extravasation continue to the pericardium. Thank you.